Okay, but right, everybody, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Neal, who's um, one of the foremost mosaic, Roman mosaic experts in the country, who's a very integral part of the team that we built to interpret and record the Roman mosaic that was found a couple of years ago in Rutland. And he's here to talk about his work on illustrating that and more, I believe. So, we'll see. over to David. Thank you very much. One of you, I don't know who it is, um, asked me for my autograph. <laughs> well, it shows you a certain notoriety already. Um, but what um, many of you will not know, um, perhaps, my, I have to admit my age, it's 83. And I started digging in 1953 with John Hurst at Northolt. Then... I lived at Hemel Hempstead and I was fortunate enough to be able to help on the excavations at St Albans. Where of course I was influenced by the attractive ladies that, that would sometimes uh, <laughs> look at the excavations. Um, I, was, I was at art school. I, was, I did um, graphic design, um, uh, but eventually but the archaeology took over, uh, as you, uh, it's obvious. And I helped on, as a volunteer with uh, Professor Shepard Freer at Verulamium. I started working there, I, su I suppose, about 1957, and, and come 59, I was, offered, I was offered a chance to dig, Molly Cotton, I don't know if you know the name, uh, Molly Cotton, she handed me a trowel, she was a well-known archaeologist, lived in Rome, well, died in Rome. You're here so often, passing me a trowel, why don't you help? So I jumped in the trench, at first I didn't know what I was doing, I have to admit, but then I was asked to excavate a, a, an oven, a double oven, um, opposite St Michael's Church. That's really how it all started, and at that moment there were excavating the uh, mosaic, the um, dolphin mosaic, that's now on display in Verulamia Museum. Well, the following year, 1959, or that's uh, when this photograph was taken, this one, um, yeah, this, sorry, 1959, um, I was asked to excavate, help excavate a, a mosaic, which is in a very battered condition. So, um, I set to and, and, and excavated it um, as best I could. I didn't know what I was doing, to be honest with you. Um, and then I was told that an expert, uh, Mary, Dr. Mary Brennan, would be coming to look at the mosaic. She didn't actually know what she was looking at. Like it's obvious. Because I did a sketch saying, this is how it went, because I was drawing out the meander. And I realised then that I had more understanding of what I was looking at than she had, and she was the expert. So I then undertook um, a, a, the, a drawing of that mosaic that you see here, and you see me um, uh, sitting at a table. In those days, the, I, I didn't pl draw anything out with a grid. I, it was Everything was measured, and I would actually colour some of it in on site onto graph paper, which is not very good because all the lines of the graph paper show through. So, um, uh, however, um, I did the drawing and I, uh, I had to, a meeting with uh, Professor Freer at the Institute of Archaeology because I was involved then in small fine drawing. I showed him the, photo, I showed him the painting of the mosaic, which he pre hitherto he had not seen. I don't understand why, but never, never mind, he hadn't seen it. Oh, can I, can I use this, David? Yeah, yeah, yes. So he took it to be photographed and I collected it some years later. But the next time I got, the following season, when I got to the site, oh, hello, Mr. Neil, from all the students. So, and they were winding me up a bit and I didn't know w why. And they passed me over the interim report of Freer's excavation, which featured a whole page this 
photograph that you see, the photograph that you see here, of my very first detailed archaeological drawing, the first, my first archaeological drawing. Then he asked me to draw the, uh, the lion mosaic um, in Verulamium, and, and then I, I, I sent him a letter saying I want to give up my work at the gas board as a designer. Mr. Thurm burns to serve was the slogan. <laughs> but it shows you how inspired they were. <laughs> because this logo was designed by Fraser in 1934. So that's how give you some idea of the de design quality of the gas board. Up, up. <laughs> However, um, he said, he sent back, I don't like seeing you eke eking out your living um, uh, on uh, labouring on excavations. However, the ancient monuments inspectorate um, uh, are, are seeking for an illustrator. So I hurriedly wrote a letter and say you better interview me very quickly because I'm very arrogant um, because I've got to get another job. And they did. They, they, they interviewed me for almost the following week. And I was told I got the job on the day I was there. Uh, uh, but yet they were interviewing other people. So that was extraordinary. And they asked me, um, do you think you could uh, uh, draw Roman wall plaster? I said, Probably, I said. And, but, but, but I didn't have the wit to ask why. <laughs> I soon found out because I joined the staff in 1961. Just um, September 61. Well, I've been at art school, okay, drawing new models at 14 years old. Um, and, and, but here I was with uh, the work of ac world of academia. Most of the inspectors were from Oxford and Cambridge, the leading universities. Um, but they were really nice to me. And um, I was in learnt so much. Tea breaks w were great because they were always talking about archaeology. And, and that's where I, I, I learnt um, much of my, my skill. But I'd already, don't forget, I had already done a lot of actual hands-on digging. A letter came from um, uh, Shepherd Freer saying that um, I've put you forward to um, excavate the Roman villa at Gaybridge Park, Hemel Hempstead, because he had been sent a letter by the council. Can he recommend anybody? He recommended me. So, so in 1963, I started the excavations at Gaybridge Park in Hemel Hempstead, and I had never directed, I never had even supervised an excavation in my life. And then I was thrown into this. However, I, I, I did it, and, and a, report was, a report was done uh, some years later, 19, um, uh, which, of course, I sweated blood on because I'd never written anything in my life before. However... It was accepted by the antiquaries and the um, fair went through it, accepted by the antiquaries and, um, and it, was a, a, became a research, it was a research report, number 31. Um, and then with, with that came the, the question, and would you like to be a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries? Well, you can imagine my, the pleasure that I got from that. Now... The department, at that time, the Archaeological Drawing Office consisted of one person, Elizabeth Frystone. She retired to have a, a child, and I was then on my own. And from that moment on, working with Gerald Dunning, a well-known name, which you may not know of, um, uh, I sat on the interview panel, and from that time on, I was able to build up this draw, archaeological drawing office of about seven people. It was very small, but on the other hand, that's all we did. We churned out hundreds, if not thousands, of drawings of everything that you found may find on excavations. In, now, we've listened to previous speakers this afternoon showing reconstructions of, their, of, the, of the buildings that have been found. It's wonderful, but you would never have been able to have got away with that in the 19, early 1960s because of academia. You, archaeological reconstruction was frowned upon. 
you, because you were falsifying the evidence or they th the academics uh, thought that you might be going too far. So it was discouraged. On the other hand, the Ancient Monuments branch um, under a chap called John Hamilton, who was in charge of that s section, um, uh, employed Alan Sowell. Now, uh, have you heard of Alan Sowell? He would produce these illustrations showing the ancient monuments buildings in their, in their context. And, uh, of course, these were not generated by um, computer-generated. They were hand-drawn. And if he didn't know what something was, he would cover it with smoke. <laughs> 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 He, he freely admitted this. You know, he said, David, I, you, you know, you just get, get rid of it. You just cover it with smoke. And, but, and in those days, as I said, it was frowned upon. The, one of the earliest reconstructions was the report by Helen O'Neill for the excavations of the Roman villa at Park Street, outside St Albans, to the south of St Albans. And it was extraordinary. But fortunately, that was a time for change. I was allowed by Sonia Butcher, another well-known name, um, to go anywhere I wanted in Britain to draw mosaics. I had free reign. I could just, if a new mosaic turned up, I would be off. And, for example, a telephone call in 1963. David, can you get down to Hinton St Mary? Yes, when? Tomorrow. So I got on my Lambretta scooter, drawing frame, and... Uh, and pop popped down there. So there they were excavating. They've already excavated half of the, top, uh, the uh, one part of the mosaic, revealing this uh, head of Christ, and excavating Bellerophon and, and, and so on, hunting scenes either side. That was a Saturday morning. Saturday we worked all Saturday. Sunday, no. Sunday's the day of the Lord. The, he, the owner of the land was a devout Methodist. He wouldn't allow any work on Sunday. So there we were, twiddling our fingers, you know, doing nothing. Anyway, so Hinton St Mary, 1963, mosaics in Kent, from Colchester, and more and more mosaics. And the drawing office at that time, as I said, we were involved in drawing. It was a facility to speed up the publication of archaeological reports. So if, if, well, what would happen is that people, they would hire, the department would hire um, freelance archaeologists. They'd get a lot of money on there for, for the first three weeks. They'd get a subsistence allowance. But on the, once they finished, they then had expected to um, write up their reports, but only got paid for, I think, uh, money for the amount of words. They weren't interested, you know, so they wanted to go on another excavation so they could earn more subsistence, higher subsistence allowance, can't say it. So, um, my, my department then would be there to create plans for them, draw their sections, drawing the objects, and as I've told you, dealing with thousands of, of objects. And eventually the mosaics by that time the number of mosaics that i had already drawn was um uh, something like 70 and uh, but, but jumping f f further on temporarily is that um when i, I after 15 years um, running the drawing office i decided to become a full-time archaeologist so i became within the department i became senior archaeologist so then I was more or less digging full time, but still drawing mosaics and taking early retirement to write the volumes on the Roman mosaics of Britain with Stephen Koch. Right, mosaics. Here's a picture of me drawing the, the Verulam and Bacchus mosaic. Very impressed by this Italian lady standing there, beautifully dressed. Uh, <laughs> So was her partner, and, um, and, uh, and then, as you can see, the, the mosaic was complicated. You had a, uh, a figure of, of um, oh, I think I can... Uh, oh, there we are. Figure of Bacchus, or oh, that's what they, uh, they said and various um, motifs uh, su su surrounding him with this me complex meander pattern. Now, it's part of a, it was part of a large room 
um, uh, with a, an extension on the north side going off up there. And I reconstructed it with, um, uh, by putting a similar um, or the same um, pattern on that side. But in all honesty, I did not know um, what, was, what the design was in that central area. Um, and when Sonia Butcher proposed that I publish all the illustrations that I had done in uh, the, the, volume one of the Britannia monograph series, Roman Mosaics of Britain, um, that is how the illustration appeared. Well, we're now in 2000 and, uh, 2023, volume five is about to come out, and um, S Steve has now, Steve Kosh, my co-author, has um, brilliantly uh, recreated um, what this mosaic would have been like had it been complete by using an example from Never Hayford, um, uh, so here you, he's, we've, in, he, we've put that panel into the missing area and that is how it, how it looked. Now my technique of drawing, this was very crudely drawn, I must admit, my, my original drawing, it was not, it was measured. But then I started using a, 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 a standard drawing frame and from, then, from that moment on, every mosaic has been drawn that way. Um, I, and I use for, for, for the colours, gouache, originally painted draw directly onto the graph paper but I soon got rid of that and painted it. Now I paint onto handmade uh, Watman paper, high quality, cost the earth but never mind. Um, and so, and the, the gouache, some of you say well that may fade but it doesn't. It, does seem to be stable and I had an, ex uh, an illustration on display at Lullingstone years, and, and um, for 30 years it hadn't faded at all. So, that, so here is the, the, the reconstruction, reconstruction and I'm very happy with it. Steve has, um, to remind me of my antiquity, um, uh, he, he's put these slides together for me because I've been abroad, um, and uh, with me bending over onto a drawing frame, and here you can see uh, the, the standard format. Now why I'm not walking around like this, I don't know, because it, it does get a bit crippling, but um, however... Uh, so this is uh, digging up Beaches Road. So this one, well, one, yes, that one is Beaches Road. I suppose that one is too, but I can't remember. Um, and then um, I also, while I was doing this work, as I said, Sonia Busher would allow me to dig, go off and um, work where I, it was invited. And I was also had requests from people to go and help them on their surveys um, abroad. So I, with Ro Roger Ling, invited me to survey Stucco on um, Stucco. Are we right, John? Yeah, S S Stucco de decoration um, in Italy around near Pozzuoli, and um, so I learned much about drawing Stucco, um, which was difficult to say the least, balancing on precarious tables to, to and trying to see the, the, see the decoration. Roger never helped because he was not into acrobatics. And so, so, so it was, and then on one occasion I was invited, asked by the department to go and work uh, in the British Embassy, which was being rebuilt by Basil Spence. So off I went. Um, uh, you can imagine I was only 25 or so and um, very nice seat on the plane but arriving at Rome airport clutching my usual uh, equipment and to be met by the uh, 
ambassador's chauffeur, black, big black Humber. Um, you can imagine <laughs> being met by the chauffeur <laughs> at that age. You know, it's quite quite amusing, really. And he took me off to where I was going to stay, and of course. It was only one trip. He, he took me. He took me to the British um, British school at Rome, where I was due to, to 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 stay for a week. And then next morning, he took me to the embassy. Um, uh, but that was it. I had to use public transport from that day onwards. The, but the point uh, um, here is that I was Basil Spencer. Basil Spencer designed the new embassy, which had been bombed by the Stern Gang. It didn't exist. It was at the Porta Pia, apart from some garages. And, I, and the, this Roman mosaic was in a, a grotto in the grounds. And so it, it was quite an easy job, actually. It was just a black and white uh, marine scene. Um, pretty boring, quite honestly. But anyway, I soon finished it. But I made it coincide with, uh, with Easter. So I went down to Sicily to see a friend and to see the, all the mosaics at Piazza Armarina, Marina, which was fantastic. Anyway, um, back uh, um, after back home, I'm married. Okay, got a son. We go off to we go off to Rome um, when my son was sort of a t- teenager, and went um, to meet meet somebody who says, "Oh, we're working on the grounds of Porta Pia. We can't find we can't find the mosaic. Where is it?" I said, "I'll show you." So um, he took me back to the grotto. The mosaic's gone. Come here. So I strutted back to, now we've got a new embassy on stilts over a pool full of slime. Put my hand in. There's the mosaic because Basil Spence had it all removed in order to line these ponds. But nobody had reminded Basil Spence that you needed to keep the water clean and, and uh, you know, this picture of architectural grandeur uh, didn't prevail especially when you've got a pond and, uh, and weeds however oh there's now we now we're at Ketton I suppose many of you are wondering when we're going to get to Ketton <laughs> <laughs> but but I but one point to make before we so my life has been in sort of three stages but when I retired and I wanted to get these volumes done which we which we which we did um, and then of course every now and again I get telephone calls probably from John not quite sure where the call from for Ketton came from but can you come and look at the mosaic which I which I duly did um, well there I am in my slippers, um, l- looking uh, at the first season. It was dug in two seasons. In the first season, um, I drew and helped as much best I could. Um, and I, I, I drew it, and then when I got it home, I, I did a painting of it. Well, I, I expected the other half of the mosaic to be excavated years hence. But, but um, damn you, Jan, you dug it the, the following season, which made my drawing obsolete, really, because I f- f- stupidly had not allowed enough room on the sheet of paper. To, <laughs> uh, I could add it on to the working drawing, but, but the, uh, and it was okay on the width of the painting, but no good on the length. So there I am, and I wasn't going to draw the first piece again, no way. So I'm, there, I, there I am drawing the second piece, cutting it out with a scalp, medical scalpel and inserting it into, into the drawing. So the painting that you see in the room there, if you look carefully, it's in two parts. You've, you've got the centre bit that's been cut out and the, uh, the, uh, the, the first piece... A painting has been inserted into it. Anyway, these are problems. Me and my slippers again, I see. Uh, me doing my usual inspection. 
So the problem with the problem with Ketan, of course, was the um, uh, delightful mosaic, which we'll see in, in, in a moment in detail, was the, its condition. It was heavily burnt. Um, well, first of all, of course, the, the, the room is almost certainly paving the north, a northern room in an old building. Um, it's very similar to Norton Disney, in, so I suspect, judging from the um, geophysical surveys and, um, and air, or aerial photographs. And um, so I set about drawing the pavement in, in the same way as I've drawn all the others with a, with a recording grid, putting a base lines across. Um, I, at least it was relatively easy because, uh, I mean, nobody apart from the diggers were, were in, allowed onto the site, so it was, it was no hassle, um, unlike Woodchester where lecturers would constantly trip over my recording grid. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I said to and of course it was obvious from the very beginning to, uh, to everybody that we were this, this fine figured mosaic was, was based on Homer's Iliad it consisted in, it, initially of course only half the mosaic was found half of three panels first one, first, second and third Oh, some, well, me at work, obviously. More general views. And this, of course, is the, um, the, second, uh, the second season of the excavation, um, by which time the, the mosaic is now very clean and, and, and looking, looking good, um, apart from the burning, which ran diagonally across it, as I, as I said, from... Uh, I think I can, can, can get this. Um, ah, yes, from cross from this area here, so that you can see one panel. Um, the first panel is, is here. You'll see it better later. First panel here, the second panel there, and the third <coughs> there. Um, and this, there's a diagonal line runs across the floor in this direction. Um, at this point, heavily burnt, seriously burnt, and where we had enormous difficulty establishing what the colours would once have been. As a, the drawing was, here you see the drawing of the first phase in the first season. With the with the three three panels, um, you can just it's not a, a good pitch slide, but um, here you can see the, the the first area of the mosaic to be exposed, showing Hector um, attacking or uh, about to have a fight with with Achilles with the horses. The next panel showed a standing figure. More about that in a moment. Pleading with a figure on this on this chariot for mercy, and then in the third panel, uh, the king, King Priam, um, holding golden vessels, which is about to put on the, the scales, suspended or, or carried across the shoulders of this burly man, with the pan here, with the Hector's body, well and truly dead and deathly white, lying across it. Well, as I said, I've, I, I painted that and made the boo-boo of not having enough room on my painting or my paper. More general pictures. General, um, well, you can see here I am checking over the first painting or copy of the first painting from any mistakes that I may have made um, while all the uh, diggers were working across and they must have, I must admit they did an excellent job cleaning it up. They really, some, some of them were really brilliant. And here is the, 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 the painting. We, I'll go back. First of all, a point to make, and, and I'm sure you can see the, 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 immediately the difference between an overall photograph and an overall painting. 
is, the painting is much clearer. Um, uh, however, back to the subject. The rectangular room, we're looking south now, with an apse on the north end um, here. And the first, before I talk about the, the, the three panels in detail, I'd like to refer to, to the first panel and this area of the apse. This is almost certainly an area where um, the owner and his guests would have dined. But it has this rather strange um, patterning with these red bands here and blue tesserae and the um, uh, fawn grey tesserae. Um, I suspect that this has uh, been repaired because of this uh, wall, which is a, a polygonal apse, straight-sided apse here, the wall had probably sunk, and so they had to repatch this. It's the only explanation I have. And in the, uh, the angles of this room, uh, here, here, and here, and uh, about here, were uh, small foundations, almost certainly, for miniature columns. So the room itself had some grandeur, and one can't help wonder whether this apse was, uh, I would call it, should call it a semi-dome, technically speaking it wouldn't have been a dome, but nevertheless you, you can imagine um, the, these triangular roof, roof uh, ceiling arches coming across. The first panel that the viewer was looking at, or the, the, the diners would have looked at, were two rectangular areas of tes tesserae of guillotte, very large mats of guillotte, one here and another one here, with a rectangular panel in between, virtually lost. However, there was a tiny fragment at this point. It was almost certainly a figured mosaic, it was a figured scene. I don't think it's a, a, somebody suggested, oh, it's just a cantharus, a, a jug, but I don't think that's the case. It would not surprise me if this was intended to be Homer himself giving a talk and holding a scroll. Such mosaics do exist. So the first, um, I, I don't know, if, first panel, as I've said, Oh, well, before I go on to the descriptions, so you've got these three panels. This is unique in Roman Britain. Um, and I think what you're looking at are three panels from a codex. Homer's Odyssey, Odyad, um, uh, Homer's Iliad. Um, three pages of a book, presumably owned by the villa proprietor, the owner. He was obviously learned. He, 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 the, the story of, of, of the classics, he was were known to him. So one can't help wonder whether this room was used by the owner as a place not just to entertain his guests, but to have actually uh, poets come in and recite uh, poetry or to, uh, readings from the classics. Uh, this man was obviously... Um, knowledgeable and he has taken a book that he probably owned three pages of of a book and one wonders how many other pages would this book have had fully illustrated and and, and, and colored panel one Here we have Hector carrying a large shield with his spear tip there, spear going behind the shield and coming up here. He's, he's, look, he's almost he's got his back to us. There is the, uh, the, the rod of the, uh, of, the of the spear running through. And this feature on carrying it across his back, therefore, is, is a holder for the, the javelins. His chariot has got this um, zigzag breastwork and um, a wheel, two wheels in fact, with um, a blue line around them indicating that these were um, lined, had iron or steel um, rims. 
His horses are smaller, you'll note, than the horses of Achilles. Um, and here they, here they are, one white, one blonde, um, with the uh, reins running towards their, their muzzles. And here you can see the legs. You've got one set <coughs> pair of white legs and one pair of blonde legs. Now, the, oh, sorry. John, sorry, I need to get that colour that back. I don't want to do something stupid. Thank you. The, the horses are, right, as I say, they're clashing with one another, the two pairs clashing, and underneath of the horses are these um, marks to perhaps to indicate mud being stirred up during this, this um, fight. And Achilles' horses, one blonde coloured and one black, um, <laughs> but, but here the harness equipment is, is uh, has, is jeweled, he's got uh, red and white dots across the, the girth and the, the shoulders. And here is Achilles um, with his spear being thrust forwards, holding a shield here. There's his arm, um, his head, um, again with a, a, a line going across his chest, similar to that of Hector, holding the... the, the, the um, the, the, the um, holder for the spears, and that you can just see there. That's that's Achilles's holder, spear holder. He's kneeling, kneeling in the chariot, one knee up, one leg down, and more breastwork similar to that of of Hector's chariot, and again with the um, with two wheels, no axle, and this this curious triangular area, which may be a rock. Meant, meant to be a rock, or a, just a simple device to fill in the space. He had to put something there, so he just, the mosaicist filled it with a rock. The, um, the, the actual mosaic, as you can see, this is the, f from the photograph. Um, it, the, so I've obviously had to use artistic license to get the, the colours as I thought they would be. And a, a point about that, these white legs of the horse of Hector's, only once was it ever photographed white, where it showed up white. All the other photographs showed them as, as, as cream, um, but it, it was definitely would have been white. Um, and that was the problem with the, with the mosaic. They were constantly changing their colour, the tesserae, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So you can see the importance, I think, of recording mosaics and anything archaeological in great detail. You've got to look and look again and look again to get the, the, the right uh, emphasis, the right details. The second panel we now know, um, once, it, once it was fully excavated, shows Tri um, King Priam, the, the, the father of Hector, to release the body of of pleading to Achilles to release the body of his son. And his son is spilling from the chariot, here he is, with blood coming out from parts of his body, being dragged and tied to the back of the chariot. Alas, that detail is missing. And he's holding, um, he's holding the big, large shield, very similar to one portrayed on panel one, and with his attendant standing in the background, arms raised. In front of, of King Priam are these tails of two sea beasts, here and here. The third and final panel shows King Priam holding these vessels, golden vessels, which is about to put onto the um, the way scales, and again his attendant is standing behind him, and this burly man with a, a, a magenta or um, <coughs> gown of some kind, um, with a arm straps here, shoulder straps, um, square 
decoration in the, on his chest and another rectangular um, feature on the waistband, waist area. Um, and here you can see the, the lines holding the, that pan. This pan is not there because it's covered by the body, this deathly white body of Hector here. And Achilles is looking on pompously. Mm -hmm. you know, the, again, he's been drawn large, large form, large size, and um, he, he's sitting, sitting on a, a rock or, uh, or a throne. We, we don't actually know, to be honest. It's got this strange rippled edge here coming round and down. And this is one of the key areas that was, you never knew what colour it would be in the next five minutes, constantly changing. But at one time I saw this band in a silver grey. They'd use a local variety of stone, silver stone. And I'm quite convinced that this, this edge, the edge of, edge of this chair, that's what I think it is, um, it would have been silver coloured. Achilles has got his elbow out, yes, right, so, so his left elbow, and I think that he's resting, that elbow is resting on the arm of a chair or, or a throne. And that, that explains what that line is just here, a slightly darker red running through there. And behind him, holding his very large, probably holding Achilles' shield, is another attendant. And there's another figure in the background here. Well, um, I, 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 there's a detail of that missing, the, the burnt head, Stephen Koch has, has done this, based on a detailed drawing of every tesserae, and which is then recolored. So that's what you see there. Um, and then, of course, it was time for the theatric, theatrics. Um, it all had to be damped down for um, photography and in no way is a little garden pusher going to uh, create enough water. So I got students to line, up, line me up about 10 buckets of water and I said I want that amount of water in each bucket. So I rushed over to them, they'd pour me a little bit of water and I'd sling it over to create the spray. So that's how the, the mosaic was damped down. Um, and I think that that is my last slide. Oh, oh there we are, um, the, the spray. Oh, the other mosaic that was adjacent to it on the, on the uh, east side was almost certainly an anteroom, a corridor perhaps. But interesting, a series of interlaced circles um, and of a, of, a, of a type which is not typical in Britain, um, but common in, in and around the Mediterranean. So we're looking at some uh, external influences perhaps. Um, there's a, uh, mosaics are constantly coming up, the, this one for example from um, outside Milton Keynes. Now Lanningstone, the, the that painting of that mosaic is, is, is on display outside and this, in, this is um, uh, uh, applicable because this is the mosaic that I had ignored. This is the mosaic I should have put into volume three but didn't, just uh, too lazy and left, left it to be photographed. But pulling, it, pulling up my records only about 10 weeks ago, I discovered features on it which were absolutely vital, should be published. So in, I set to, I telephoned Steve, my co-author, and said, if I finish this in six weeks, Steve, can we get it as a pull-out in the back? Yes. So I was then spent six whole weeks without, almost without stopping just for sleep um, doing this painting. And the reason why this painting is important is because it, it has good evidence, archaeological evidence, from the forma for, formation of the tesserae that the room was expanded on no less than two occasions and this odd, odd, this odd arrangement of tesserae around here, as you can see, has clearly been reworked. This area is a meander pattern. Why? How do you explain this? Well, I, I, I know how to, uh, to explain that because some um, couple of years ago I was standing on that mosaic wondering what this was. And I've done it many times and I hadn't, the penny hadn't dropped. And I stood there. This was a Monday. Monday, no visitors on a Monday. I stood and the penny dropped. 
And I shouted, oh, you silly bugger me. Um, because I was standing on the doorway of a ramp or staircase that would have gone down into the cellar at Ludingstone. Many of you would have been there. Um, so that's, there's a direct link between what was going on in this room at Ludingstone with, with the activity in the cellar. But again, I come back to archaeological illustration that you must draw in everything in great detail. Think about what it is. It's not just accidental coincidence. You, you've just got to draw and draw and think about it. And that, and this is, archaeological illustration is an art, and we must not lose sight of that fact. That's, I think that's all I need, or you need. Thank you.